your life. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Andrew Zimmern, AZ Cooks, Instagram Live. Hello, YouTube audience. We love you too. Uh, we think we have corrected some of our focus and sound issues. We have some slick equipment uh, coming for next week that's gonna make another vast improvement uh, to this. But six weeks in, things are rocking along. Hello, West Coast, hello, East Coast. We're coming to you live from beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, let's get right to uh, a couple of very, very important things. First of all, in a couple minutes, we're gonna make our watermelon salad with fried chicken. Absolutely out of this world. Combines, I mean, to me, the essence of summer, I think the only difference here is that the, the fried chicken won't have time to cool enough. I typically like this with room temperature fried chicken and icy cold watermelon. I just think it's a fantastic combination. Uh, but other than that, this is how I make this dish in my home and it's one of the more popular things that I make for my family and friends. Um, more importantly uh, than that, uh, today is uh, Bourdain Day, hashtag Bourdain Day. Uh, it uh, is Anthony Bourdain's birthday. Uh, and hashtag Bourdain Day was something that my friends and his very close friends, Eric Repair and Jose Andres, uh, started as a way to uh, celebrate our friend's life. So uh, if you care about uh, Tony, if you care about the things that he cared about, uh, whether it was, you know, 1950s French film, uh, whether it was the underground music scene uh, in New York City, whether it was traveling, whether it was food, whether it was about family, his compassion for other people, his empathy uh, knew no bounds. Please send a thank you note to uh, at Chef Jose Andres or at Eric Repair uh, on Twitter and let them know that you think Bourdain Day is a great thing. Um, we will answer questions later, and invariably, I know that we are going to have some questions about uh, our friend, and that's fine. Um, but we're going to cook a little something together, and a dish, by the way, that I picked, knowing that he would he would love this. These were the kind of flavors that uh, he really liked, and uh, and I'm I'm. It's a little emotional for me today too, uh, so I wanna get to cooking and we can get uh, more emotional later on. Oh, other thing, next Thursday, uh, we don't know what we're cooking yet together, uh, but we're also uh, saluting uh, sobriety and recovery, and we are raising money uh, for uh, chemical dependency, alcoholism, drug addiction uh, treatment here in Minnesota. Um, and so I hope that you will spread the news in the sober community and to other people. It's a great opportunity whether you can give a dollar or whether you can give more than that or whether you can just be an awareness raiser and send it to all your friends and let them know. That's next Thursday uh, on AZ Cooks Live. So without further ado, let's get down to making our fried chicken salad. Um, this is such a textural winner and it's such a great contrast in flavors, textures, and temperatures. All great food is about contrast a hot dog, an ice cream cone. I mean, I love the idea of an ice cream cone, especially the those waffle cones. They're still kind of warm at the scoop shop. Something that's crispy and warm with something that's cold and sweet is a perfect example of what we're talking about. Um, I've got a summery watermelon here. Small, seedless. Uh, I'm gonna put these uh, into the garbage can. Uh, usually the side pieces of my watermelon, after I'm done cutting them off, I will actually scrape the insides um, and I put them in the blender uh, and I leave it for the next day's uh, breakfast. You know, it's great for juicing uh, these pieces. There's actually quite a lot of meat in there. Let me show you what we're giving up here, right? That's a nice, that's a nice piece of watermelon right there. Mmm. You know, I opened this up and I said, too pale, not gonna be sweet, this is delicious watermelon. Um, but these shapes I'm reserving for another use. And the reason is because I really want this core of the watermelon to be the foundation 
of our salad. All righty, tuck this away onto my bowl here. Hopefully this will all support it. All right, next step. Reserve that piece. I want to make a few sets of cubes. Now all of this other watermelon is being eaten. Go get the go get the salt, go get the chilies. But I want to set this up into some perfect cubes. And I'm cutting it from the heart of the watermelon so you know that I have the absolute sweetest part set aside for this dish. So, let me get rid of this. Let me, uh, what am I gonna do with that one? Oh, I have a bowl. We have a very hungry crew that I know is gonna wanna eat this delicious watermelon. We don't wanna waste anything. Um, I actually, coming from uh, a family, a Jewish family in New York, my mother's side of the family, uh, they were uh, Russian Jews. And so uh, pickled watermelon rind was something was a big part of our uh, experience growing up. Um, and I'm really addicted uh, to pickled watermelon rind. I absolutely love it. Uh, so I use all parts of the watermelon. Don't waste anything. Uh, so what I want to do is set up my watermelon salad by putting a whole bunch of these squares. And I want people to see space in between them. So one of the best ways to do that is just to make, you can fill in a couple of these uh, spots, but just make some angulated lines around there so that the pieces of chicken have watermelon to stand on, right? Put that over there, and that will be the foundational fruit pillars that our fried chicken will sit on. Next thing we wanna do is fry the chicken. Uh, these are chicken thighs. Uh, they've been sitting in scallions and buttermilk overnight. Um, I will usually save the buttermilk and scallions uh, and make a sauce uh, with it. I'll put it in the fridge and cook it because obviously with the raw chicken in there. Uh, but a lot of this scallion mix in there is gonna go in to our dredge, and you can also double dredge. I'm gonna show you that technique in a second. I just tested our oil. It's 365 degrees or thereabouts, which is just about perfect. Now, with the scallion and buttermilk, you can put it in the cornstarch and flour mixture, right? And quite frankly, Roll it around in there a couple times, and that's gonna be a lovely piece of chicken to fry, right? When we talk about double dredging, we talk about wetting it again. And what you're really doing, especially if you don't squeeze it and pound it down, if you don't work it too much, you get an insanely textured crust on there. So all I'm going to do is put a bunch of pieces of chicken in there. Make sure that they get coated really nicely. And these are just small chicken thighs that we quartered. And then I'm going to dredge them again. And you can see all the scallions sticking to there. And I just roll that up and you can see how much sort of bigger it got. It's almost like a part of that chicken 
is gonna be a scallion fritter, which is fine, right? I mean, we have these crispy, crunchy scallion um, batter pieces adhering to our chicken. And because the chicken pieces are small, I am not worried about them cooking all the way through and the outside burning. Let's say you were doing giant sized chicken breasts like this. You kind of have to be careful uh, because what you don't want to have happen is have the batter start to burn, the dredge burn in the oil before the chicken is cooked on the inside. That would be a uh, bad cookery. We're trying to avoid that. What kind of oil are you using? Uh, I'm using peanut oil to fry in, but you can use, you know, safflower or corn oil or some other kind of vegetable uh, oil. You just want to avoid oils that have too many solids in them. Uh, fruit oils, nut oils that are just, um, uh, their flash point is too low. Olive oil, you would not want to fry in. Toasted sesame oil. Is there any way that you could substitute the chicken with a veggie? You could this do dish? this. You could literally do this dish frying anything. I will tell you right now. I have made this dish with just basically fried dough dumplings, uh, like little scallion donuts. Um, I've made this dish with corn fritters. Same kind of thing. All right, I'm gonna wash my hand. By the way, a little note, if your hand looks like some kind of giant white Dr. Frankenstein thing when you're done dredging, uh, don't wash your hand in uh, warm water. Uh, it's just gonna activate the gluten in the flour um, and it's just gonna stick more and more. You do not want that. Just rinse in cold water and it will all come off. All right, oh, it? by the way, I should mention, um, this is half flour, half cornstarch. Um, you can experiment with all kinds of different starches. I, I sometimes use tapioca starch. Uh, it gives it a really great crispiness. This gives a great crispiness. If you're double dredging, I tend not to use a rice or tapioca because uh, those starches, if it clumps up too much, sometimes give a little chewiness to the uh, piece next to the meat if you are not really careful about cooking it enough. But you'll see with the double dredge, and look, you can single, you can single dredge, right? But wait till you see, here's one that we put in at the beginning. Look at that. And you can almost see the nooks and crannies. And I'm telling you, this is as brittle as glass, the outside of that. We just want to make sure that these pieces are cooked all the way through. Oh, actually, I should show you, if I was really smart, which I just became almost instantly. I'm gonna show you. Let me fry a couple pieces that are not double bridged. Just as delicious and yummy, but one dredge on here. Now, the dressing for this, uh, you know, this time of year, I cook a lot of uh, foods from warm weather places. And one of my favorite uh, warm weather destinations in the world uh, was also uh, one of Tony's, uh, and that was Vietnam. And so I'm using a nuoc cham, a seasoned uh, sugar fish sauce and uh, lime juice dressing for this. I'm gonna wash my hand again. They're asking what's an indicator that they are cooked all the way through. Well, it's really a time function. I, I cut these pieces rather small, so I know from my experience that these take about 
five or six minutes uh, to cook all the way through. I also am gonna rest them for a little while. But when you cut them small like that, when they start to get real sort of walnut brown, you know you're good to go. So that piece is one of the first ones that I put in. This monster is one of the first ones whoop, that I put in. You can see the three newest ones I put in, they're smaller. What's the um, oil temperature? Uh, the oil temperature is probably right now, probably gone up to about 375 and stayed there. Um, I fry on this uh, electric cooktop all the time. And when I put it to five or six on there, it gets it up to about 360, 375. Then we're dropping food in, so it drops down a little bit. Now the temperature is back up. It does not take long to fry a small piece of chicken. There are the originals. I just don't want to turn my back on this and make my dressing, which happens very, very fast um, until I'm ready to. And by the way, the resting of this fried chicken is super, super important. Um, because you've double dredged and because you've used uh, the cornstarch flour methodology, and I'm seasoning this now, not only does it fry up pretty darn dry because we fried up at the right temperature, I mean, there's not even a lot of oil debris coming off of these. I mean, look at how crispy and dry those are. I mean, this is, can you hear this? That's really crispy and delicious because it's buttermilk and scallion. Um, but it's going to rest and keep cooking while we build the rest of our salad. Because I, I don't want to serve this with hot, hot chicken on top of the cold. You know, warm room temperature is fantastic as long as it's crispy. All right. So, and I know we've made this a bunch together, but thinly sliced garlic, thinly sliced. That garlic will, will cure in all of our lime juice and fish sauce uh, and sugar, and you'll bite down into garlic, it's gonna be really sweet and yummy. Uh, grated ginger, brown sugar. We always do equal parts brown sugar, fish sauce, and lime juice, plus a little more lime juice. Chilies, minced chilies. Ooh. Shh. Do you hear what just happened there? It stopped sizzling. So do you know what that means? It's another indicator that it's done. Food, you use all your senses when you're cooking, and you can actually hear the water that's in the chicken and the batter, the buttermilk, all that stuff, once it evaporates completely, the cooking process is vastly accelerated. It's like when you make French fries, right? Um, we've all done that at home and experienced the, um, what happens when all of a sudden it gets very quiet. They start to brown really, really fast, right? Because you can't brown in the presence of moisture. So they're cooking along, cooking along, cooking along, and then eventually they give up the last of their moisture, boom, and it browns. Uh, all right, where were we? A little bit of sesame oil, a little bit of peanut oil, and I do that with this particular sauce that's very untraditional for a nuoc cham because I'm making a salad, and we're gonna put a lot of greenery in there too. And of course, my secret ingredient for all of these, which is toasted ground, sesame oil and what i want to do with this and that fish sauce by the way if you're not familiar with that ingredient fish sauce has got a ton of salt in it it is a very salty ingredient oh wow they're asking you if you're seasoning your chicken now 
Uh, well, I seasoned the chicken with salt when it came out of the fryer. And that's all I'm going to do with it. I just added a pinch more sugar because you really are looking for that fish sauce, lime juice, sugar trilogy to, you know, stand front and center and then everything else you want to taste in balance. And how do you cut your garlic and ginger usually? Uh, you can use a uh, small mandolin. You can go slowly and use a knife. Would fried fish work well with a watermelon? Oh, it would be fantastic. Fried fish would be delicious with this. Um, garnish. Some ground peanuts, some crispy fried shallots. You can do store-bought. These are homemade. Uh, and we have our nuoc chop. But most importantly, look at this beautiful, beautiful mint that we got from JP's garden. I mean, how fantastic is this? Uh, as the summer goes on, JP, who is the head of uh, culinary at our uh, hospitality company, shames everybody by bringing stuff in from his gardener. He really is an incredible, incredible gardener with a really big uh, green thumb. I'm gonna put a little bit of those mint leaves because they're so gorgeous and whole. Um, and I'm gonna just take a little bit of cilantro. They're asking if the dressing is similar to the one used in the salad in the bag that we cooked almost, the other night. Almost identical, except it didn't have any oil, right? If I put oil in that one in the bag, it would prevent a lot of, it just doesn't match. Here I'm doing more of a salad um, and I like to, Sort of, it's, I guess you would call it almost a Nuoc Cham vinaigrette, right? Because of how I'm treating this. Um, I also find it tastes better with the chicken. Uh, it's not as sharp, it's not as uh, aggressive. And then I have some great uh, basil here. Now, you know, if you have access to holy basil, um, the fantastic basil that comes uh, from Southeast Asia, by all means, go ahead and use it. Um, but if you happen to have some traditional Genovese basil lying around, this is just gonna be so yummy. Would it be okay to add fresh tar tarragon? tarragon? Yeah, it could go right ahead. I mean, remember, tarragon has an anise flavor, a little licorice quality to it. I think it marries up just beautifully uh, with this stuff. Um, all right, let's use this dipper. This looks like it's about the right size. This is a two ounce ladle. And I'm just like, I just wanna stir this so I have the right balance of everything around it. And I am seasoning this from the outside in. I am not worried about where those liquids are going. They're gonna go right to the center. Right? And you don't need more than two ounces of dressing. The dressing is very strong. You don't want to overwhelm the watermelon, right? And we want to see these beautiful sprigs. Put a couple of the double dunked, a couple of the single dunked. I like odd numbers. Does it matter if the watermelon is chilled or not? Uh, well, I like it chilled. I took this watermelon right out of the refrigerator because I happen to like that contrast in temperature between all the warm things like the chicken, which is probably still a little bit hot inside, and the crunchy room temperature things like the shallots. And I just absolutely adore the uh, cold watermelon with that. And then once this is set in there, I, I, I find that at a certain point, and I love cilantro, don't get me wrong. At a certain point, uh, you can overdo it with the cilantro, but with this particular salad, because of the affinity that fish sauce has with mint, oh my gosh, you go ahead and you put as much mint as you want 
on this. I happen to be searching for these, you know, pretty little clusters there that represents new growth on the plant. And you almost are gonna eat the mint like a, like a salad green. And there is this super simple fried chicken and watermelon salad. Now, if, and I say if, you are like me, and you like food that's just a little hotter, we put some red chili into the vinaigrette, but by all means, throw some more chili on there, just so you get those little spikes of a different kind of heat, right? The raw chili that hasn't sat in that fish sauce mixture is easy to do. The other thing that's fun gives you a chance to work on some of your knife skills. You can put a couple of jalapeno slices in there for a little bit of punch. Super easy, super fun salad. And the great thing about this, you can build this on a platter and put it down and let everyone share. This is definitely entree sized, maybe a little bigger. Um, but something smaller could be an appetizer, but the way that I usually do this is I put it on a big oval platter and I'll put all the squares of the watermelon down. I'll put 25 pieces of chicken on top and I'll make a huge platter of it and it goes down in the middle of the table along with a couple of other uh, dishes. Um, for those that were wondering about the chicken. Is this recipe on your website? Perfectly cooked. And yes, of course the recipe is on the web on the website. AndrewZimmern.com. One stop shopping for all of that uh, stuff. Um, so yes, recipe is on the website. All the recipes for AZ Cooks are on the website. We try really, really hard. In fact, uh, Vicki, whose voice you can hear uh, talking during AZ Cooks, is one of the people who makes sure that even when I'm like joking about a recipe, because people write in and ask that we make sure to put it on the website. So uh, thank you, Vicki, for making sure that happens. Let's see how this is. What's a good side dish that would go with this? Mm. I would serve this with sticky rice. I would serve it with some wok tossed gailan um, with just a little bit of oyster sauce. I would serve this with uh, a green bean uh, salad, maybe with a ginger vinaigrette or some other sort of, uh, I mean, lots of greens, sticky rice, perfect with this, wow. Extraordinary, really, really perfect. The reason this cooks up so well is because the pieces of chicken were cut in something that looked like a golf ball with a piece of it shaved off, right? Like a, I think all of our chicken was about this size. And that's really, really important. Is there like a best way to freeze and reheat fried chicken in order to serve it crispy? if you need to cook it in advance. Freeze and then reheat? You mm -hmm. mean like TV dinner style? That's a question I got. Maybe cook in advance fried chicken? I do not, I do not freeze my already cooked fried chicken. I will tell you that you can batter the chicken, put it on a sheet pan, cookie sheet, put it in the freezer. When it's frozen, slide them into a bag and just keep doing that all afternoon long. And the reason you freeze them and then put them in a bag is you don't want them all clumped together. And you can then freeze the frozen pieces just like they do at the ballpark. What kind of chilies did you use for heat? Uh, I used a, uh, a red Fresno and a jalapeno. Where did you get your glasses from? Uh, these are iBobs. I get my glasses from a bunch of different places. I really dig iBobs. I really dig Warby, Warby Parker. I really like this new company called Caddis, C-A-D-D-I-S, that I'm absolutely in love with their glasses. They only have like eight or nine styles, but I just love them. C-A-D-D-I-S dot com. Would you rather eat dog food or cat food? 
That is a great question that I have never been asked. Um, I would rather eat cat food, and here's why. I think it's all marketing, but the cat food commercials, it's, it's like, you know, Frisky's Buffet, like it's something fantastic. The dog food commercials, Alpo, there's just a big dog lumbering in and just scarfing all the food down. Um, now, that being said, there's all these companies and our, you know, Pretzel, who is the Instagram uh, favorite of many of my fans because he licks my head every night before I go to sleep. Um, you know, he's eaten at different times in his life some of those like fancy, it's only natural ingredient kind of stuff. Um, and I've actually tasted those and it's not that bad. I also went through a phase where I made his dog food and I would make two weeks worth at a time. He's a, he's a 12 pound pug, so it's like kind of easier because um, he's not eating so much. Uh, but it was easy with, with carrots and peas and rice and ground turkey and cooking it all together and then just putting it in baggies and throwing it in the fridge. What's the longest you've gone without a shower? The longest that I've gone without a shower? Uh, nine days. Is there a story behind it? Uh, there is. And, and by the way, this is not like out in the wilderness where you're bathing in a cold stream every once in a while. Uh, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Um, I keep forgetting about it. When I started, right before I came into my current sobriety, 29 years ago, um, I did not shower for like eight or nine months. I just had a dirt and grime on me that took days, days to come off. It was uh, horrific, but I didn't care about myself. I was a user of people and a taker of things. Um, and uh, I was living in an abandoned building in lower Manhattan. Um, we'll talk more about that next week. If you could make one more feast with Anthony Bourdain, what would, it, what would you make? If I could make one more? Mm -hmm. Feast? Oh, I would, I mean, he, <laughs> I posted a picture earlier uh, today of the last time he came through the Twin Cities. Uh, he did a tour stop on his uh, Blood and Guts tour. And he had called me like six months beforehand and he had said, hey, I'm coming through town, I'm doing this thing at the State, State Theater, I think. Um, I said, yeah, I, you know, I heard about it, can't wait, we're gonna get tickets and, and go. And he's like, well, no, I want, I'm asking certain friends in certain cities because I'm traveling so much, I'm doing so many things. I want to be with someone on stage and have a little more fun and make sure my energy is right. Um, so, you know, Eric was doing a bunch of shows with him in New York and I think Roy Choi did some with him uh, in LA. I forget who some of the uh, other folks were. I'm sure he did one with Jose uh, in DC. Uh, and uh, he said, would you do one with me here in Minneapolis? I said, sure. And he got into town, you know, you know, playing from wherever, like one in the afternoon, went to his hotel, nap changed, uh, and he called me, so I'm heading over to the theater, do sound check, blah, 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 blah. We go on at seven, when are you getting there? I said, well, what are you, what's your plan? He says, I'm just gonna hang out at the theater. He said, do you wanna come down? And I'm like, yeah, I'll just meet you down there, we'll just hang out and I'll bring, I'll bring food for us. We can just hang out, watch TV in the green room, do whatever, and catch up and shoot the shit. And uh, so, I, made uh, cold peanut sesame noodles with our homemade chili oil, which was always uh, in the opportunities that I had to cook with him, for him, uh, was something that he always wanted me uh, to make. So that picture from earlier today, that's what he is uh, eating. So I probably, um, I would probably do that. Um, I would have a lot of cold shellfish iced you know, clams and oysters and crab and lobster, because he loved that, uh, and grilled meat. He was a red meat lover, so I'd probably do some sort of fantastic red meat thing. You're getting a lot of questions of favorite memories with him? Oh, well, I posted one this afternoon and actually saved a part of the story, and this is probably a, a, a really good one, uh, because he thought it was funnier than hell, and I did too. Um, so if you're a dad, doesn't matter what you do for a living, your kids just don't think you're cool. And uh, Tony, to, to me, was just the king of cool. I mean, he was the, he was the king of cool. He had swagger uh, like nobody else. He walked into a room and, and owned it. It didn't matter where. And uh, he would come home from trips and be hanging out with his daughter 
and they'd be you know flipping around the TV channels when it came time with little kids you know you want to watch TV with them they want to watch TV for an hour or something and his daughter was a big fan of my show and wanted to watch he would call me and like whispering in the phone I'm on like the third episode of your show. This is awful. This is torture. I'm, I mean, it was so funny uh, that his kid wanted to watch my show because to her, dad was dad. When I got to share with him when he said that, I started laughing. He's like, what's so funny? And I said, well, at, at night, you know, my son has no interest in watching me. He would watch Tony's show and ask me why it couldn't be more like him. He would, he would say, can't you, be, you should be taller and not be so fat. It was hysterical. Um, and Noah was a huge fan uh, of Tony's program. And it just so happened that like four or five months after that, and this was the second, the picture that I posted today on Instagram of us at South Beach Wine and Food Festival, has to be like seven or eight years ago. Uh, he was down there with his family, I was down there with my family, and our kids actually got to meet and hang out and you know swim in the pool and eat a lot of ice cream together, and it was great that they could, uh, they could do that. But Noah sort of only had eyes for Tony. It was, I, I literally didn't exist uh, with my own child. It was, it was pretty darn funny. Um, and I think what most people uh, don't realize is that for those of us that are privileged enough to come into your homes on television, you have a very, very personal uh, relationship with us, um, but we're kind of disconnected from our fans, right? Like music, musicians play out at concerts and stuff like that. Um, but Tony was great around his fans and he loved, absolutely loved, loved, loved uh, people. He, I mean, I think that came across in all of his uh, shows. Um, but there was a very, very personal side to him that those of us were lucky enough to share and just catch, we're, we're, he was a regular guy just like everybody else. And I think that um, part of the struggle that we all have uh, with fame, for those of us who are not uh, born into it, either through family or kids who are like sports or music prodigies and just kind of never stops, they're always special. For those of us, like Tony or myself, sort of a similar story, who developed fame on TV later in life, um, that imposter syndrome thing is real. I mean, you're walking down the street thinking to yourself, oh my God, I didn't call my friend and I'm exhausted. I don't have energy for anything and I'm a horrible person, oh my gosh. Um, and then people are screaming, I love you, I love you. It really gets conflicting. You have to learn how to manage that. Um, and that was something that uh, uh, he talked about, we talked about a lot, together it was something we shared and we talked a lot about fatherhood. It was, uh, it was a topic that was very near uh, and dear to us. And yes, because people always ask, it was very competitive over who got to what destination first. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was just one of those things that we endlessly uh, joked about and we would interrogate each other. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where's the next season going? Where are you headed? Um, so yeah. It's a, today is a great day to remember what an awesome social commentator he was, what an expert he was in anything that he turned uh, his passion towards. Uh, most people know him for food and, you know, a lot of witty sub-references, but whether it was, you know, new wave German cinema or, you know, arcane um, late 70s, you know, Boston punk rock scene. I mean, he could talk for hours on anything uh, that interested him. Uh, he was the the most fascinating person uh, to date, truly, uh, that I ever met. And uh, oh, I'll leave you with one last really good one. So it's the uh, the first day we're shooting promos for Travel Channel. He had a season of his show under his belt. Travel Channel had bought. Um, uh, Cook's tour from Food Network aired, I think aired it while he was out with the ZPZ folks shooting season one of Parts Unknown, I think is how it was working. And he was on Monday night. And for like nine months, they tried like three or four shows uh, to run before his to sort of build a night of programming on the network. And mine was scheduled, first season of Bizarre Foods was scheduled to roll out on his second year on Travel Channel, on Monday night, right before his. 
and uh, day one, moment one, we're together. The we're the crew is way down. They're gonna have this long lens shot, and we're gonna just walk, no talking, down the uh, Brooklyn, the Esplanade, over on the Brooklyn side of the uh, <laughs> of the East River. And uh, this could be like the quintessential sort of New Yorky shot, and then they put some music underneath it uh, to promote Monday Night on Travel Channel. And the, I'm, pay, I'm, you know, I'm the newcomer. I'm the new guy, and so I'm paying real close attention to the director all the way at the end. And he just leans over and he he whispers. He says, "You know, if your ratings are any good, maybe we'll wind up being friends." And then action, and we walked. Through, and I was just stunned. We had to like stop and start the whole thing over again. Cause I was like, what do you mean? And then he's telling me, he says, yeah, no one, no one has lasted on my night. Uh, and it was just one, it was just super, super. The other thing he said that day, um, and I've talked about this before, um, I mentioned something about, you know, oh, I wanted to maintain my integrity or some something about keeping integrity in, in television. And Tony laughed at me and he, and he said, have you signed a contract yet? And I said, well, of course I did. We, you know, half the shows of season one are in the can. And, and he says to me, then you've already sold your integrity. You don't have any integrity left. You're taking money and you're working for a TV network. He says, you can kiss that baby goodbye. And uh, he then followed up by telling, and I looked at him and he, that's when he said to me, he said, television is an evil mistress, um, almost in a Faustian way. And he was right about all of that. Almost every piece of advice that he ever gave me and any witty sort of life comments that he made in my presence has proved to be true. That's the kind of guy that he was. Anyway, uh, please uh, send a note at Chef Jose Andres at Eric Repair on Twitter and thank them uh, for creating Bourdain Day, uh, a time that we can all reminisce about the great and wonderful things uh, that our friend represented in this world uh, and celebrate him the way uh, he deserves to be, an icon uh, of his time like no other. Um, thank you, see you next week. Tell all your friends, tune in because we're we'll talking about recovery. We're gonna be doing a little fundraising. You do not need money to show up. You can raise awareness about it. Remember, addiction alcoholism touches every family in America. Um, Am I leaving anything uh, undone? I don't think so. Uh, have a fabulous uh, rest of the week. Have a great weekend, and we will see you later. Adios.